Well, all right, everybody. How about putting your hands together and help me say hi to our broadcast? Come on, let them hear you. I say it week in and week out, but it really is a privilege and an honor to bring you our service, both the worship and the word. We believe like nothing can change our lives like God's word. Amen, everybody. There's something about how God's word is life changing for us. And we believe it's life changing for you. And before we dive into the word today, let me just take a moment and encourage you to please send your teenagers to Motion Experience. I was speaking at a church in Tallahassee that we planted with Pastor Jordan, Experience Church. And there's a young man that came up to me and who's a leader in that church now. And God, is he's just so thriving. He's blossoming, fruitful. And he said, Pastor, I just want to thank you. I said, for what? He said, I just want to thank you for the difference. I had an encounter with God at Motion Experience, and I've never been the same. And when he shared that with me, I thought to myself, I got to tell our church, man, the power that takes place. We believe that our kids are having, an, they're going to have a divine appointment with God at Motion Experience. Can you believe that with me, everybody? Huh? Can we do that together? I really want you to, because... I just, I want to see their lives changed. I, I really do. All right, listen, we're in a sermon series called Momentum for Your Mind. I launched it last week, week one, and I said, we have to renew. Everybody say renew. renew. We have to renew our mind. The first thing that the children of Israel did when they crossed over the Jordan River, they had to take this walled city called Jericho. And I said, when you cross over into your salvation, your mind is a picture of this walled city called Jericho. The Bible tells us nothing, no one went in and no one went out. And I said, if that's not a picture of our mind that needs to be renewed, strongholds tear, tore down so we can let the lies out, come on, and get the truth in. Because if you don't renew your mind, you're going to struggle in your Christianity. You're going to say, hey, why is my mind not as alive as my spirit? Because God renews your spirit, but you have to renew your mind. And we identified the kingpin lie. Identify it. And then weaken its walls. And then watch your emotions and bring it down and walk in victory. Amen? That was week one. Download our app. It's all there for free. Just listen to it and catch up with us and grow with us. Next week, I'm going to talk about how to shake off rejection because we've all been rejected. How to shake it off your heart. Shake it off your mind. How to gain momentum from rejection. But today, it's a very unique message. And uh, I've entitled it Unstuck from Self-Pity. Unstuck from self-pity. Um, have you ever been in a bad place where you feel like there's a little self-pity going on in your world? Come on, we all have, haven't we? Uh, have you ever been invited to a pity party with anybody? Come on. Of course you have. We all have. Come join me and let's all pity together. I don't even know if that's the right term. But we all have the ability to find ourselves in self-pity. I want you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 5. It's a biblical picture of a person that was just paralyzed by pity. Oh, he had a physical issue, but I believe it was more than that. I believe that there was a spiritual, emotional, soulish in his mind. And before we get to John 5, you, whether you turn there or click there, I beg you, get there so you can see it. But at the end of the day, I want to show you a really cool verse of Scripture. Because it's important that we identify what pity is. Here it is, Psalm 40, verse 1. Here's what came alive to me. He brought me out up. He brought me up also out of a horrible, if I say that word, come on, horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. Now, you say, where's the definition of a pit, of, of, of what pity is? You see, when I looked up this word horrible, it's not how bad of a place he was in. It's how loud the roars in his head were. 
See, that word horrible means, if you, as it comes up, up, up here on the screen, it means to roar. He was hearing in his head self-pity talk. Why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? Where are you, God? Where are you? This isn't fair. I didn't sign up for this. Come on, we've all said that, yes or no? We've all said that. We've all had those moments that those roars are in our head. Go back to that verse of scripture that he said, he brought me out of the roars that were in my head. See, it's not the roar of the enemy in first Peter where it says the devil goes around like a roaring lion. This isn't devil pity. This is self pity. This is my own roar in my own head telling myself, woe is me. Why am I struggling here? What's going on? Well, God, where are you? Why'd this happen? Why'd you allow this? And I say that to you because the more it roars in your head, the more you allow your inner voice and even your outer words to go to that place, you're going to keep digging a deeper pit. He wasn't in a real pit. He wasn't in a real pit. This was a mental place, a soulish place in his heart and and in his mind especially. It really is. This is why I say it this way. Hey, uh, self-pity is a pit that we dig for ourselves. And we need to be careful that we don't live and dig a home in self-pity. David had so much that could have caused him to live in a place of self-pity. Many of you might not know this, but theologians believe King David was born out of wedlock. His mother's never mentioned. As a matter of fact, when he's confessing his sin with a woman named Bathsheba and their child out of wedlock, he talks about himself and he says, in sin did my mother conceive me. Read that in Psalm 51. Then you go over into his life Talk about a man that could be susceptible to self-pity. You go over into his life and you realize the, Sam, the prophet Samuel is going to Jesse's house to anoint the next king and all the boys are lined up except David. His father doesn't invite him to be previewed by the prophet. Many believe that David was a picture of his sin and of his shame that he didn't want to parade in front of the prophet. Oh, that's, that's my boy. That's my mistake. That's my sin. That's my shame. No wonder in Psalm 27, he wrote this phrase. When your father and your mother forsake you, whoa, then the Lord shall take you up. What's going on in his soul? God, I didn't sign up for this. What did I do to deserve this? Who set this up? This isn't fair. I didn't ask for this. And that roar was in his head. God brought me out of that horrible roar. Got me out of that miry clay, those, those voices that were sticking to me and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. He got me going again with momentum. God can bring you into a momentum when you shake off all that, those voices. Can I hear a good amen, somebody? And that was going on in his head. And I say that because anybody, especially King David, had to deal with so much stuff. Have you ever read the Psalms? Anybody ever read a Psalm? Anybody? One Psalm. All you need is one Psalm. You'll see this dude is like bipolar. I mean, he's like this. <laughs> up one second, down the next, up one second, down the next. You're like, whoa, that's a lot. God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you turning your ear from me? But then you're my praise. You're my. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there's a part of him that had to constantly fight. Look at me from living in the pit. And so do you, and so do I. We've all been there. We all have a reason to stay there. We've all been invited there. But life is meant for us to get up, come on, and to get going 
in Jesus' name. That's going to be us, all right? Brings us to John chapter 5. And in John chapter 5, there's a man that is paralyzed both physically, but at the same time, emotionally, in his soul, with self-pity. The Bible says he was laid at a pool called Bethesda. That's where all the sick people would gather. Why? Because in certain times, John chapter 5, I'm just paraphrasing the story, an angel would come and stir the water. When the waters would be stirred, the first one in got healed. And Jesus comes to him and he says to him, hey, hey, knowing he was there 38 years. How many years? How many years? Remember that. Not 38 weeks or 38 days. I'm talking about a long lasting life and self-pity. Woe is me. And Jesus said, knowing you was there for 38 years, here's what he said to him. You ready? You think you'll ever get better? You think you'll ever be well? One translation says this. Do you even want to get better? As if the problem wasn't healing or heaven. The problem was him. Come on, somebody. This is serious stuff. Because I've been pastoring a lot of people for a long time. And I'm like, whoa. We got to gain momentum in our mind. We got to renew our minds like last week. We have to shake off rejection, like I'll talk about with what happens with people, and then even what happens with life. Even with life, no matter what your past, your predicament, your pain, your parents, we're not going to live in the pit. Can I hear a good amen? We're not going to live there. And so he says, get up, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the Bible says he got up, and he began into his destiny. Now, I want to just give you three thoughts. They're fill in the blanks. But I want us to get out of our horrible roaring pit. Our woe is me. Our, I can't believe this has happened to me. Oh, life is unfair. Oh, I didn't sign up for this. Where is God? Why, God? This is it. Number one, you and I have got to learn to rise. Everybody say rise. Rise above our limitations. You know, the Bible tells us that that, that pool in John 5, 3, that in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered. They were just waiting for the moving of the water in John 5, 3. You know what? How many of you know that there's people all around us hurting? Come on, I just said, there's people all around us hurting. Every person, whether it's physical or emotional in their soul, there are people that are hurting, impotent, blind, whole, withered, somewhere in their soul or in their body. And the truth is, I've learned this in life. And my mom and daddy ingrained this to me. You know, there's always some people that are better off than you. Come on, come on. But I mean, you know that there are people that are worse off than you. And my mom and daddy would always say, son, there's always those that are worse. There's always some that have don't, don't live in self-pity. You know, there's a group of people all around you hurting. It's not just you. Self-pity just gets you to focus in on you. Come on. There's people all around us hurting. And my mom and daddy would say, come on, get up. There's other people that have been cut from a team. You're not the first one to not make the basketball squad. Come on, you're not the only first one to you know, struggling. You're not the only first, you know, you're not. But at the end of the day, you got to realize you're not the only one. There's other people hurting that are worse off. Yes or no? Have you ever heard of a guy named Job? I'm scared to read that book of the Bible. Oh my gosh, this dude loses everything from the get-go. His family, his kids, his goods, his vision, his dream, his business, his home, his health. I think we're a lot better off than him. Come on, somebody. Well, pastor, you don't realize 
how bad my job is. Look at me. You've got one? We, sometimes we, we don't realize. This is what the Lord showed me in Matthew 25 when, and he kind of, he kind of, kind of, kind of took me out in the woodshed with this verse. It says, unto one he gave five, to one he gave two, the other one one. And we always look at talents, you know, like, like there's always somebody that gets more giftings, more money, more abilities, more something. And then there's always someone, if you're, number, if you're looking at this guy, right, there's always someone that gets less. And the Lord one day said to me, he says, what if that's true of all of us? What if we're all twos? What if there's always someone with more? Come on. Well, what if there's always someone with less? And what about pain? You know, there's always someone with more pain. And then there's always someone with, come on, less pain. I was watching this, this little clip on Instagram of a preacher named Nick Vujicic. This man was born with no arms and no legs. Has anybody ever seen that clip on the internet? No arms and no legs. Not to make fun of his future, but if you watch him on stage, it's, it's heartbreaking. And he was almost in the pit in his own mind. He's like, he wanted to go into the ultimate pit and take his life. The final pit in his mind. And he said, no. And he encountered Christ. And he realized that God, even in my limitations, I can rise above them. Come on, somebody. I can rise above them. And the Bible, and the Bible tells us, his testimony tells us what the Bible did for him. The reality is, is he began to get hope and life and rise above his limit. He, he, he was telling himself, I'll never get married. That was his roar. Can I just tell you something? He's married today. He said, I'll never have kids. He's got kids today. Come on, somebody. Hey, he, he, he's like, uh, what kind of purpose can someone with no arms and no legs have? He's around the world, stages around the world, inspiring people. If I can rise, you can rise. Come on, somebody. Rise above your limitations. Because I'm going to give you this one key thought. No pit is meant to be perf permanent for a Christ follower. Never. Oh, I can visit one. I've been to one. I've had pity parties. I've been in them. I was discouraged in times. But God says, you can turn that into a pit stop, but not into your pit place. Come on, somebody. You turn that into your pit stop, but not your pit place. I'm getting up out of here. I'm not living here because it's important. Jesus is saying to this man, hey, there's so much more for you. When he said in John 5, 6, he says, will you ever be whole? What he was really saying was, you know that there's more for you than this, don't you? There's more for you than this. Much more for you than this. It's as if he's, Jesus is saying to you and I, please don't let life pass you by feeling sorry for yourself. Please don't let life pass you by. You sitting here thinking, why me? Where are you, God? He said, come on. This is so vitally important for each of us. No pit should ever be permanent for a Christ follower. Ever, ever. I think about this verse in Psalm 16. It comes up. David says this. Check this out. This is so cool. For you will not leave my soul in. Say this word, everybody. Come on. Oh, I'm glad you said it like you like saying it. He's like, man, yes, I get to cuss in church. No, it's a real place. And uh, it's really translated in the Hebrew, Sheol. You ever heard of that word? Which really means a pit. The grave was like a pit. He says, but you won't leave me here. Now check this out. He says, neither will you suffer thine holy one to see corruption. It's talking about how Jesus too. It's both David's life and the prophecy of Jesus. Because how many know that Jesus is the only holy one? And how many know that he didn't spend more than three days in the grave, so he didn't spend four days to be corrupted? 
and it's prophetic. And so when I saw this, I said, David is saying, the pit's not permanent for me. By the way, the pit's not permanent for Jesus. And by the way, the pit should never be permanent for any Christ follower. Because look at me, how many of you believe that one day, if you die before Christ returns, your, you will rise again from that grave. The dead in Christ will rise again. You believe that? Yes or no, somebody? Come on, you believe that? The pit is never meant to be permanent in your life. Get unstuck from it. Number two, take up your excuses. Now, this one's going to be a little strong, and he was quiet in every service on this point. Okay? But it's okay. You need a little, we all need soberness. Amen? Hear me. Jesus looked at him in John 5, 6 and said, Hey, man, will you? He said, uh, Jesus, seeing that he was lying there and learned of his condition for a long time, he said, Hey, man, do you want to get well? In verse 7, he just starts telling every reason why he wouldn't. Well, the invalid, you don't realize I don't have anybody to help me. And when I'm trying to get in, it's always somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Let me say it again. It's always somebody else's fault. Now, I want you to see this, man. Jesus would ignore his excuses and address his effort. I'm not here. It's not that Jesus is heartless, but the way he comes to him is like, you, you would think he would come to a man who's been there for 38 years with a little bit more of, hey, man, I get you, man. Come here. Put your hand. Yeah. No, Jesus hates pity parties. It's like, hey, you want to get better? You think you'll ever get better? You want out of this? And he just starts listening his excuses. I want you to know something. This is important. See, our excuses can kill our efforts. Come on. I've noticed people give so many excuses. It's as if they use what's happened to them. And I know this is strong, okay? To let something die in them. Don't let something die in you. Don't let, your, don't let what God has for you, your potential, your destiny, because something has happened to you. The reality is, in John 5, 6, what, go, go to the next slide, you'll recognize uh, one was there for 38 years, and Jesus asked him, will you ever be made well? And this thought hit me. 38 years. Let's say the angel came once a year. 38 people Prove this man wrong. 38 people prove this man, come on, different. 38. I was thinking about it. That's why you can take two people with the same predicament and one can thrive and one can struggle. I thought about how one son, grown up without a dad, can still put himself through high school, finish high school, Come on, graduate from college, make something of himself. Even if he's, he was raised without a dad, if he can do it, you can too. Come on, somebody. If some mom who's deadbeat dad left him, her and the kids all by herself to raise them, putting, making means work together. If one woman can land on her feet and raise her kids in the house of God and not grow bitter at Jesus. If she can do it, you can too. Come on. You can. If Nick Vujicic, born without arms and without legs, can stand up and say the best he can, stand up with his heart and his voice, you can find purpose again after pain and after heartache and all this. You can too. Come on. If one person can file bankruptcy and still come back and say, I'm going to fulfill what God's called me to, you can too. Amen. Pastor, why are you so passionate about it? Because the pit's never meant to be permanent. 
And the pit's meant for us to get up and to fulfill our destiny. Can I just tell you what the pit's really for? Let self-pity turn into self-discovery. Every time I get in a pit, please let what, what do I need to learn from this? What was maybe my part in this? Well, how can I grow from this? You know, Jesus finds this guy and he says, hey, go and sin no more. You'll read it in John 5 later on, unless something worse happens to you. I was like, hey, whoa, what was my part in the pit? Maybe none of it, but maybe some of it. You know, Joseph was in a pit, wasn't he, everybody? Remember, his brothers took him and threw him in a pit. You're like, well, well, he didn't do anything wrong. Maybe he flaunted that coat of many colors one too many times in the faces of his brothers. How do you get all your brothers to hate you? You think maybe you should look back over your actions? Come on. Are you hearing my heart today? Will you ever? He's not listening to our excuses. He's checking our, will your marriage, look at me, and I I say this with compassion, will your marriage ever get better? Will it? You see, Jesus was saying after 38 years, I thought you'd finally inch your way closer to that water. You got 38 years. Get as close as you can to that water. And if even you think there's a stirring of, in that water, hey, even if a raindrop hit it and started dribbling, get in. Touch it. Do a swan in it. Do whatever you got to. Will your marriage ever get better? Will you ever have a better marriage? Well, you, oh, pastor, I don't want to, but you don't know who I'm married to. I've heard that so many times. Sick of it. Will you ever forgive? Come on. Well, you don't know what was done to me. Come on. Will you ever serve? Well, you don't know how busy I am. Will you ever tithe? Well, you don't know how strapped I am. Jesus is sitting here thinking, I'm not here to dialogue with your excuses. I'm here to ask you about your effort because I want the best for you. And I believe, I believe he wants the best for you too. And me. Is this all right, everybody? It's going to have to be. Last but not least, walk into your destiny. I want us to get out. If God forbid you get in one, remember this, this message. But the reality is, is that the Bible tells us in this next slide, Jesus tells him, rise. Come on, say it with me. Rise. Come on, say it loud. Rise. Above your limitations. Next phrase, take, come on, say it. Take up your mat. Take up your excuses now and walk. You know, one translation says, take up your bed, but their bed was this. It wasn't a bed, no box spring, no mattresses, no bedposts. This was their mat, a little yoga mat. It's not mine, by the way, if you're wondering if it's mine. All right. I like the color, but it's Jackie's. Nice design, babe. There it was. That was her mat. And he was laid down on it. Jesus said, now listen, I want to talk to you about your effort. I want you to rise above your limitations and I want you to get up. There's more for you than 38 years of self-pity and life passing you by. Get up. And he got up. And I have to believe he did this. 
just like this. Take up your bed and walk. And this is how I want us to walk. Take up your bed and walk. And then he walked with it and the Pharisees said, whoa, it's Sabbath. You're not supposed to be doing any heavy lifting. And he looked at him and he said, hey, the guy that healed me told me to do this. So I'm doing it. He carried it. I wonder why Jesus had him carry his mat. 38 years, that thing would stink. Ain't no Lysol wipes wiping that thing down. <laughs> like at a gym. I'm serious. Why would he carry this? Three reasons. Take a picture, write these down. May the Spirit of God remind you this. Because the key is God never wants you to get back in it. He said, I want you to be mindful. How did I get there? In my self-discovery, I don't want to go back there. How did, I, how did that marriage fall apart? I don't want to do that again. Were you foolish? Were you selfish? Were you not listening to counsel? What was it that caused you to go into the pit? Why, are, why is it that you're in debt? Oh, I know what it is. Just, 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 I can't get off eBay. Get off eBay. I can't go back there. You see, the thing about it is, is that he wants you to carry this. It's like, oh man, I don't ever, 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 ever. Because I know how I got there. Number two, I want to walk humble because praise God, look at me. I'm not there. I'm not there anymore. I'm not at the pool of Bethesda. I'm not in my pity party anymore. I've gotten up and I've gotten out and I'm moving into my destiny with Jesus and I'm living in my life that God has for me. There's more for me than me just feeling sorry for me. I'm not, I'm going to stop the roars in my head and I'm going to walk humbly. I'm not there anymore. I've made some mistakes, but I'm not, uh, I'm not there and I'm walking humbly. I'm not going there, and I'm walking. And by the way, I'm going to carry this mat because when I run into somebody that's in their own hurt, because I'm, I live in a sea of fallen, hurting humanity, physically or in their soul, I want to tell them, I used to be on one of these. And what used to carry me, now I carry. And so can you. And you can walk in newness of life and walk into your destiny. Amen, everybody. You receive, get something out of that today, everybody. Huh? Hey, would you stand with me and let me pray with you? Allow me the privilege of doing that. Come on. Here we are, Lord, in this sacred moment. You have so much for us. And Lord, there's people, we've all, in the sea of humanity, we've all suffered pain and loss. We've all suffered predicaments and we've all been hurt by family or friends. Lord, at the end of the day, I thank you that you have more for us than for us to be laying on a mat uh, just hearing the roars of self-pity of why me and woe is me. But Lord, in Jesus' name, may we rise up above our limitations, knowing your grace is sufficient, knowing that no pit is meant to be permanent. You'll come by. You'll lift us up. You'll lift us out. Our eyes are on you, not on ourselves with self-pity, but on you to do something that only you can do. And may we stop talking about our excuses and start examining our efforts. What am I doing to get closer to a better marriage, a stronger marriage, a better walk with God, a better place financially? What am I doing to get a better relationship with my boys and my girls? What better thing can I be doing? May we stop using excuses to stay paralyzed in the pit, but may we renounce them and say, no, I'm going to make a step, even if it's a baby step in in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that we can walk in the fullness of our destiny, never to go back, always walking in great humility and at the same time trusting you that you have called us into a greater destiny than a horrible pit. You said you brought David out of a horrible pit, Lord. 
Out of the miry clay, you set his feet upon a rock and you established his going. You gave him momentum. Give us momentum as your people carrying our mat to a world that is in need of hope. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody said, come on, give God a great big praise, somebody. (laughs) 